So everything okay, Tim? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. We welcome any on Zoom or uh, listening elsewhere. Um, downstairs as well. So it's good to see you all this morning. Um, just a, one or two notices. Obviously, we're back to uh, media on Sundays. Other than that, apart from the house groups, things are as, as normal on the list. Um, I should just mention that um, Lily had a little operation on Friday and all went well, so that was good. Mm -hmm. okay, so thank the Lord for that. I'd like to read to you a, a verse of scripture from Psalm 96. It says here, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Well, we can't, unfortunately can't sing this morning, but in our minds we can, can't we? Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. So lovely verse there, verses from, from Psalm. Thank you, Alan from Psalm 96. And shall we remember those? For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. And this morning we can praise God, can't we, in our hearts. We cannot openly sing, but we can praise him within our hearts. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity of coming together this morning. We thank you that we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our Friend, our Redeemer, our Lord. And we pray you'll just bless us. We pray for all who are listening that you will bless them too. We thank you that you are a mighty God and can do marvellous things. But Lord, we thank you that our salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ and we give him all the glory this morning. We praise his wonderful name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to listen to a song now, a hymn, To God Be the Glory.
It's really good to have uh, Doug with us from Christchurch this morning. Uh, we've known Doug for many years. Um, he was coming to this church before I came, so uh, it's a long, quite a long time ago. <laughs> probably, you probably remember how many years it is, Doug, but I'm not sure. But it's good to have Doug with us. And you know, Doug has got a real interest in the Lebanon. You know, he supports a group who are working in the Lebanon. And um, I thought it'd be nice if um, Doug could come up and give us a talk, an update on the Lebanon in Beirut and all that's going on there. So I'm going to hand over to Doug now. Thank you very much, Colin. Good morning, everybody. And those on Zoom, nice to see you. Uh, especially those who are here, those who can see me, you have an advantage. You can switch me off if you don't like what you see. So uh, <laughs> it's good to see you and good to be back with you. Um, I've been in touch with my friends in Lebanon over the past few weeks because of the situation in Lebanon, which has changed somewhat. And I've put together a little um, update on the work of New Heights in Lebanon, for your sake. So I'll move to the side. This is the um, <coughs> Lebanese flag. It often gets mistaken for the Canadian flag. Um, because they have a maple leaf in, the, uh, in it, and this is the cedar of Lebanon. And uh, that was one of the, that shows how much the Lebanese think of their country. Um, they can even dress up their window boxes to look like their, uh, their national flag. Can you see that? Because, uh, uh, I thought that was very good um, <clears throat> from one of the Lebanese folk. And uh, this is where Lebanon is. Um, it's, I don't know why it's, why it's jumping around there. Anyway, it's, um, Lebanon is there on the, it's on the Mediterranean Sea, just across from Cyprus, and Syria surrounds it on three sides, and uh, Israel is at the bottom there. And you can notice some of the um, Bible names there, Tyre, Sidon, uh, and other places that you'll find in the Bible. Biblos is in the Bible, and Juni, and places like that. So that's where Lebanon is. It's, it's a small country, it's about half the size of Wales. It, it was it's mentioned 75 times in the Bible, you probably knew that, and um, it's a French mandate. It was mandated by the French until 1941. It was called the Paris of the Mediterranean because it's such a beautiful country, and the Switzerland of the Middle East because of all the banking facilities that were there. If you're fluent in Arabic, French, English, and Armenian, you'll be most welcome in Lebanon. And uh, yeah, that's the uh, one of the things when I'm in the schools is and I, I'm in the playground with the, uh, the breaks, to, to hear the children switching from Arabic to French to English quite easily. Uh, uh, someone asked me, what, one of the children once asked me what I spoke, I said English and rubbish, and, uh, <laughs> which, which, is, which is about right for me. Uh, and that's, there's, there's a comparison of how big Lebanon is. Um, I can't understand why it's jumping like that. Um, it, it's, uh, it's about half the size of Wales. So, um, so that will give you a, a little picture. Of it. The work of the, the work that I'm in, involved with is called New Heights, and um, Ronnie is moving on its own. Here. <laughs> I can't control it. Now stay, stay. Do as it told. Stop using it and ask him to change. Ask him to change and then stop okay. using it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I'll do that. The, it's, it's, New Heights is the name of the ministry. It was called um, Grain of Wheat International, but it's now changed its name to New Heights. Um, thank you, Tim. It, Ronnie Basus is the um, is the CEO, and um, that's his wife Rachel and their three children: Reuben, Ruby, and uh, Rosie. Um, so they're five R's, um, and he's been uh, he's been in the work as long as I've known the work. So. Okay, Tim. Uh, it, uh, one of their ministries is in the Bekar Valley, which is in the um, it, it's the it's the breadbasket of Lebanon. It's a beautiful place. It's also the headquarters of Hezbollah, um, but that's beside the point. It, it's a lovely place. And down in the Bekar Valley, there are sixteen refugee camps. Okay, Tim, if we can move on. And uh, we have a laundry project in these sixteen refugee camps. Um, and we run 60 children's programs <coughs> over the year. 60 children's programs have been run uh, because along with the laundry that we do in the camps, uh, they run a, a two-hour children's program. Uh, it's two, two programs. Uh, the first two hours is for the children who will be working in the fields in the afternoon and the second two hours is for the children who've come back from working in the fields in the morning. Uh, so that runs alongside the laundry project. It's a scripture-based project and uh, 
we do a sort of a 12 week period as well and we visit the same camp every week so it's a 12 week cycle uh, over 16 refugee camps that we run so sometimes it's two times a week and the laundry project if we can move on Tim please the laundry project is we've got a couple of vans that we've uh, put four washing machines in uh, we've put a generator in and we've put a reservoir of water in so we can do the, the, the laundry for the women in the camps and while the laundry's going on um, then that's when the children's program is going on as well. It's called Made Clean, the project. Hmm. I, I would like, I, I've said to Ronnie that uh, my, the next stage in this is, is to do the ironing as well and we'll call it Made Flat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay Tim, thank you. Uh, and, that, and, that's, and the ladies hang their washing out on the Siegfried line or the, uh, or the camp line. Is it? It's okay Tim, thank you. And this is the children in the, in the sort of the makeshift um, tents that uh, the people live in and they, they offer up a space for us to run the programs for the children. Okay, Tim, thank you. Uh, as you know, on the 4th of August this year, there was that explosion, a huge explosion in the, uh, in the docks. The docks are in the, the port area is in Ashrafia, which is a predominantly a Christian area. Um, in the sense that the people who are there are, are not Muslim, they're basically Christian, aligned to the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church in some way, or the Greek Orthodox Church in some way. And uh, the explosion took place, and uh, thanks to him, and lots of people were... That, that's the port on the left there, as it was, and this is what it was like after the explosion. And uh, it went, the, the blast went some 12 to 13 miles, destroying stuff. Uh, obviously receding as it went further, but um, it just damaged a huge amount of, of area. Uh, lots of people were killed and lots of people are missing and they'll never be found. Um, because they were right at the heart of the blast somewhere. Thanks Tim. <clears throat> uh, the team were working in their office 20 minutes uh, before the blast took place. And they left their office just before the blast took place and were on their way home when the blast hit the, hit the offices because they're in that area. And it's, they've done $40,000 worth of damage has been done to their offices. Uh, but they've been back in their offices a few days later uh, to get the renovation underway. Thanks, Tim. And while they were doing that, they decided they would move out into the afflicted areas and focus on the children as much as they could. So they've done 1,600 gift boxes for children uh, with games and food and stuff that kids like, sweets and stuff like that. They've produced 250 food parcels for adults in that area who've lost their homes and uh, they've been able to listen to the stories of the adults and pray with many of the families. And one of the mothers at least has asked for a Bible. Uh, one of the uh, Muslim mothers has asked for a Bible as well. So there we go. <clears throat> Thanks, sir. And, and what they've done is they've taken one of the vans out of the refugee camps and brought it up into Beirut in order to do the laundry uh, for those who've lost their homes and so forth as well. And also for Christian organisations. Thanks, Tim. I think we've made a list of it. Yeah. So they, they, they're doing clothes and linen for a variety of organisations, both Christian and non-Christian. Uh, they're doing the uh, laundry for damaged, the hospitals that have been severely damaged, for volunteer movements <coughs> that are sort of ground-level volunteer movements, for theological colleges like the Baptist, the Arab Baptist College, and they're doing bedding and clothes laundry for the families as well. So they've moved one of the vehicles up uh, to do that and to provide help. Okay, Tim. They also run a digital ministry alongside what they're doing because they're working with children and uh, young teens. And uh, they've run a digital ministry and they've had 2.2 million gospel presentations. They've had 43,000 new contacts. Um, they've seen 47 people uh, trust Jesus. They're running four new programs and they run seven weekly discipleship meetings on Zoom and on their digital ministry. Okay. And uh, they've, they've just um, run... I normally go over in July and August to help with the internship program to do teaching and pastoral care. And the, it's called the, uh, they've now got an I Cultivate One Hope internship which to deal with the fact that they can't have people coming. So they've done it all on Zoom this year. Jordanians and three Lebanese in the program and they did daily training and ministry and content creation and discipleship because they were helping them, the, the six folk, they were helping them to produce their own programs to put out on uh, online to reach out uh, in, 
in gospel presentation and ministry to people as well. And they've had some good response from that. Thanks, Tim. They've recently produced three digital outreach programs and 20,000 people have engaged with the gospel as a result of those three programs. Uh, is there any more, Tim? Yes. Uh, we, work, we have teams in Syria, Iraq and Jordan. Those are the places I can't go to. I have been to all of them, but I can't go to them now. In Syria, the clubs have opened up, uh, socially distanced, of course. And in Iraq and Jordan, they can only, at the moment, distribute books. Iraq is particularly dangerous for the team at this particular time and has been for a long time as well. So um, they've asked us, Ronnie's asked us if we will praise God for the opportunities to share the gospel through their emergency programs and for the new believers who've come to faith, for the safety of the team, even in uh, Beirut, the team that can be in danger, and to pray for strength, for the team to continue their ministry, for security as they travel and for future funding as well. Thanks, Colin, unless anybody has a question. Is that clear enough? Yeah. Really okay. Okay. So it, it, um, it's interesting, isn't it, that they, sometimes in the Middle East they can do more than we can here. Yeah. Especially with children. Yeah. Schools. Thank you, Doug, for that update. You know, we're always interested Thank you. in your visits to the Lebanon, and we praise God for that, because that is uh, a wonderful ministry they do. And we continue to pray and support that work, I'm sure. Could I just also mention, um, Julia, do you just want to mention Abhijan? Would you like to? Yeah, you can, if you'd like just to give the opportunity. I'll just move aside. It's going out online. Yeah. Thank you to all of you who've prayed for our brothers and sisters in Azerbaijan. Yesterday, we had some really, really heartbreaking messages um, from the people that we know. Um, in the church in a place called Ganja, which is the second city of Azerbaijan. And there's a church there, and lots of the people from that church came to our conference. And we met um, pastor, a pastor there and um, some other friends, and um, they've, they sent us messages yesterday um, saying that, that there was a, um, there's been a missile attack on their city. Um, several missile attacks on their city overnight when people were in bed and lots of people were killed, lots of houses were destroyed, and they're in absolute terror, fear for their lives, because they don't dare go to bed, because in case it comes again in the night. So last night we had a special prayer meeting on Zoom for them, um, and we prayed from seven till eight. And at 10 past eight, uh, as we were finishing praying, um, one of the leaders sent us a message to say that they've just heard that there's been a new ceasefire announced, which is amazing. The last ceasefire didn't hold for even two hours. So please, if you could pray that the ceasefire would hold um, and that people would be kept safe, God's people there. Um, obviously there are Christians on both sides of this, but it's such a devastating and terrible conflict. And we just pray that peace will come. So thanks very much for those who have prayed. Thank you, Julia. Shall we just uh, have a time for prayer now? And we're going to pray for obviously the work in the Lebanon and also pray for Abu Bajan as well, that peace will reign in that country. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the work that's being done in the Lebanon. We thank you for the group that is working there helping the people, but also telling them about the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> we thank you for the opportunities they've had. We really pray that you will continue to bless that work. You will direct those who are organising it and give them much wisdom, Lord, we pray. We pray that the funding will come in and they will be supported in all that they seek to do. So, Father, we continue to pray and encourage us to remember them in our prayers this week not only this week but day by day that you will bless them and be with them and encourage them and support them Lord we pray we realize it's not an easy time but we thank you for the faith that they have and the work they're doing in your name amen, amen. amen.
And Father, we would pray for Azerbaijan. We do pray for peace in that country. Yeah. Yeah. We pray that both sides will negotiate and will come to a satisfactory solution mm -hmm. so that all people there will live in peace, one with the other. Mm -hmm. We really pray about that. And we pray for uh, those people we know who are Christians there just be with them and give them great courage and strength at this time. We pray that you'll, you'll meet their needs and you'll protect them and watch over them, Lord, we ask. So, Father, we commit that situation into your hands. Amen. 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 <clears throat> well, as I say, it's really great to have Doug with us today. And uh, Doug's going to share a little message with us next. So I'm going to hand over to you next, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see if the. Um... Do you want to swap it for yours, Doug? I've got this on. We'll see if it works. And I can swap it for more if necessary. Alan, yeah. oh, thanks. Okay. Oh, you just it to the check. A big one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're, we're, that's where we're reading from, so that's nice to get the reading up. I've got to put my glasses on. <laughs> I want to read from Hebrews 10, and this passage of scripture. So. And uh, the, one of the things about Hebrews is that there's a big, a big debate about who actually wrote it now. Um, obviously, tradition uh, from many, for many hundreds of years was that Paul is the author. In the last couple of hundred years, the scholars have all argued that um, maybe it's not Paul who wrote it, but uh, uh, Apollos, Luke, Barnabas, Priscilla, or even Silas. So you can take a choice about who you think wrote it. Um, uh, but uh, so that's one of the things that apparently the, the, um, the scholars tell us is not clear at the moment. But, but traditionally, it's Paul who's been writing. And the church has thought that that's what uh, for many years we, we, uh, we argued. And, and so the writer says this in uh, Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. May God bless his word and help us as we think about those uh, few verses this morning. There was a, a man um, who... Uh, went off to a medical centre one morning, he went into the medical centre, he went up to the reception desk and the, uh, the lady at the desk, um, the receptionist asked him his name and she said, now, um, why have you come? What have you got? And he said, shingles. Oh, she said, okay, um, you, you need to see a nurse. So she said, uh, just wait over there. And then she got the nurse and the nurse came and said to him, what have you got? He said, shingles. So she said, I must uh, take a blood test. And she took a little blood test and she said, just wait here because I need to get you to a doctor. And so she went off and she got him to a doctor and the doctor said to him, hello, what's your name? And he gave his name and she said, and said what? what have you got? And he said, I've got shingles. And the doctor said, well, where do you have them? And he said, they're outside on my lorry. Where do you want me to dump them? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a confusion of communication, isn't there? And, uh, and, and I guess, but one of the things when you read Hebrews, and particularly in that passage we were reading, it's clear that one thing the writer to the Hebrews is not confused about is the superiority of Jesus. And uh, he says, as you read it, or she says, as you read it, that Jesus is superior to the angels, he's the superior apostle, he's superior to Moses. His covenant is superior. His sacrifice for sin is superior. He is the superior high priest. 
<clears throat> because he doesn't keep changing like all the other high priests did. His prayers for us are superior to all other prayers because he intercedes for us directly with the Father. And he's, uh, the writer to the Hebrews teaches as you read through it that Jesus' priesthood is superior to the Aaronic priesthood. And, and so he has a high view of Jesus in, uh, the, in the book of Hebrews. And the other thing that I find helpful, or these things are what I find helpful about the book of Hebrews, is that it makes clearer, as you read it, the, uh, our understanding of the sacrifices in Leviticus. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have read Leviticus today, or already or read it recently, um, because most Christians find it a very difficult book to read, and a very difficult book to understand. I find that reading Hebrews helps me to understand Leviticus and to understand the, the sacrificial system more clearly. So uh, it, it helps explain some of the Old Testament. It encourages perseverance. When you read Hebrews, it encourages perseverance. You know, um, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. And then in Hebrews 2, we're told not to drift. Don't allow yourself to drift and this salvation to pass you by. It talks about the importance of maturity in chapter 5 because um, he says that, look, you, you, should, you should be aiming for maturity, but you're still taking milk. And you should be needing spiritual food to make you mature. Uh, and then in this passage, in chapter 10, he talks about our connection to Jesus uh, should connect us to each other in a different way or, or in a deeper way. Do, do you remember that last verse that I read? He talks. He says this um, when, uh, when he writes. He says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, th th that's the day of the Lord, uh, uh, which the, the, new, the early church understood as when Jesus comes, he brings judgment as well. So, so he said, look, we're living in the light of the coming of Christ and we shouldn't, we shouldn't fail to meet together and to encourage one another and to strengthen one another. And I think that's important. And, and when you start reading, as we did, ch chapter 10, verse 19, what's gone before is a doctrinal argument in those previous verses where he's arguing about the fact that the sacrifices offered in the temple, the Levitical sacrifices, um, don't deal permanently with sin and in a sense that God never intended them to deal permanently with sin because they only covered sin and they didn't bring forgiveness and so he says but that's all changed with the sacrifice of Jesus because through Jesus he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and uh, so th there is there is um, and also forgiveness, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. That was the message of the early church, wasn't it, in Acts? And then having established that in chapter 10 in those previous verses, he now moves into these practical, this practical application of what he's been teaching. And he says that our connection with Jesus, uh, if we love the Lord Jesus, we're connected with Jesus in that saving sense, but it also connects us with each other. We become part of the, the family of God, and he says, because you're part of the family of God and connected with Jesus, one of the important things to remember is don't give up meeting together. Now, this may have been written, uh, Hebrews may have been written, because it's not clear who it's written to and the destination it was going to, but it may well have been written from sort of evidence in the text to, to um, Jewish believers who spoke Greek and who understood and had a vast knowledge of the Old Testament. And so he's saying to them, look, uh, You've become Christians and you're probably suffering as a result of that, but don't give up meeting together. Because in meeting together, we can worship, we can encourage each other, we can strengthen each other, we can have fellowship with each other, and we can learn how to be disciples together. So, so that's where I want to focus for a, a few minutes this, this morning, on worship. Now, I, I, I don't know if any of you are art enthusiasts, I'm sure you are very educated in that area. But uh, does anybody know, can anybody guess or know who, who painted that picture? It's the uh, Madonna del Cap Cardellel, Cardellino. So does that, can anybody, anybody guess? 
If I tell you 1505 it was painted, does that help you? That's good. Big one? <laughs> it's Raphael. Raphael. Yeah, you know him well, don't you? <laughs> you read him regularly. <laughs> read him regularly in your quiet time. And uh, he, he painted it. It's, it's, as I said, it's, I'm just going to call it the Madonna. But he, he painted it, and the, the, the picture here is of Mary, the mother of Jesus. He painted it for a friend's wedding. It was a gift for a friend's wedding. And, and the, the two boys are represented of John the Baptist and Jesus, and there. there's a little goldfinch in there, and uh, the, the, in between them. And the goldfinch, uh, because it apparently moves and, and goes into thorn bushes, it represents the, um, the crown of thorns that Jesus wore and the suffering of Jesus. So that's, that's the explanation of it. And it was given to the friend, and 40 years after it was given to this friend for his wedding, there was an earthquake, and the, 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 the painting was shattered into 17 pieces, and it, it, it got really messed up. And, a, and a, a well-meaning artist tried to repair it and nailed it together um, with nails and painted over it and tried to sort of glue it all back together again and put it all back together again and made even a bigger mess of it. <laughs> And, um, and then, then you add to that the years of grime and uh, dust and people who tried to repaint it a number of times and it really was a mess. And then 50 people took 10 years to restore it properly, to remove the grime, to remove all the dull veneers and to paint it in the as, as far as they could find them and, and make them. And so it now apparently glows with the deep colours of the original. It's been wonderfully restored. And so now it looks like it did originally because it's been beautifully restored from what it was. And, and I, I found that a fascinating story because to me it said, Doug, you're a product of a miraculous restoration. Because in your encounter with Jesus, he's restored you. He's made you a new creature in the sight of God. He's restored you into a relationship with the Father that was broken by sin and uh, given you a new hope and a new life. And, and we don't, but what I find fascinating is, I, I don't know if you ever do this, but as I get older, I sometimes have to battle with my past. Uh, with the memories of my past, with my sins and my failures. And, and the older I get, the, the, it, it's, it's even deeper. You know, I wish I, it, could I have done more? Could I, should I have, I can't go back and say sorry, but I wish I could. Do, do you ever struggle with that? I do, I honestly do. And, and with my sin as well, with, with the, uh, it leaves scars in my mind and in my heart. And um, I battle with all of that. But then I remembered, Jesus has restored me. He's forgiven me. And my, he's buried all my sin in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. And, it, and what I've learned is don't, don't try and paint over. Don't try and nail it all together and make it better because it won't happen. You need to draw near to Jesus and new and afresh discover his love. And I, and I find that, as we worship together this morning, I find that helps me. You see, the word worship in the New Testament is only used in relation to the worship of a divine object, like, uh, for example, for God. So in chapter 1, he talks about the angels who worship God, who bow before him. And, and I was thinking, what does worship mean for me when I come to meet with you, my brothers and sisters? What does it mean for me? Well, it means this, that it means I can rejoice in the greatness of my Saviour, how great thou art. How great they are. It, as I worship, it clarifies my perspective on life. It helps me to see things steadily and see them whole because I can see them through the work of the cross and the resurrection. And I get balance. It feeds my mind with the wonder of God's character and personality. That God, he loves me. He cares about me. He cares about you. He cares about us. And, and as we, when we can, sing the songs of praise or mumble behind our masks, as we might do now, our songs of praise are based upon the object of our praise. Majesty. Majesty. Worship is majesty. 
So, so worship is, is, it means a lot for me. Robert the Bruce was the King of Scotland in the 14th century. And uh, when he died, he said to his great friend, Sir James Douglas, he said, would you take my heart to the Holy Land? Because he'd always wanted to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and never did. So they, took, they cut out his heart, put it in a silver casket, and Sir James Douglas and uh, no doubt an army went to the um, Holy Land to take Bruce's heart. But they, they, they got involved in a battle when they got to the Holy Land with the Moors, and uh, it was obviously they weren't going to win this battle, so the, the story goes that Sir James Hamilton stood up in his stirrups on his horse, whirled the silver casket containing um, Bruce's heart into the enemy ranks and said to them, said to his soldiers, he said, follow the king, follow the king's heart and conquer. And when I, when I was reading that, and, and I thought to myself, yeah, that's what happens to me when I worship. I want to follow the king's heart because that will motivate me to participate in God's purposes for the world. God has a missionary heart. He loves the world. And when I worship, it reminds me of God's missionary heart. And when I worship, it reminds me that the strength I need to handle the disappointments, the tragedies, the demands and the sadnesses and the daily difficulties of life, I can find in the Lord Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. That's, that's how I find worship helps me. I trust maybe it will help you that as well, because that's the heart of it. And above all, I think, this this came to me when I break bread sorry I come from a brethren background when I break bread when I take wine and bread it, it helps me with my worship because you see I'm taking ordinary objects which speak of an extraordinary story I'm taking common objects which are unique in what they teach me and what they show me so worship I find immensely helpful and I don't want to stop meeting together because I know I can worship on my own but I prefer to worship with my family because I have a greater sense of God's presence when I do worship with my family. And then uh, it, the other thing here is fellowship. We, we meet together in fellowship. Now one of my favorite, I confess this, my, one of my favorite series of films is the Ice Age films. Uh, is that, have you seen these films? They, they are, I think they're fantastic films. They, they, they have so much in them that, that's so helpful and, and, um, uh, and uplifting. And, and in the first film, the, this is from the first film, that if you don't know the story, the, 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 the mammoth in the middle there is called Manf Manfred. And then on the left, the saber-toothed tiger is Diego, and then Sid the sloth is the, um, <laughs> is the fun character in it all. But he's also a, a very good character. And in the first, um, in, in the first uh, story, they, are, um, they, find, they find a baby, because the mother uh, with the baby from a nomadic tribe has been attacked by saber-toothed tigers. She's run down to the river, and uh, she's lost her life, but she's managed to throw her baby to safety. The, the, the three, um, the mammoth, the, the sloth, and the Diego, Sid and Manfred and Diego, find the baby, and they're determined to send it, take it back to its parents, or to its father in the nomadic tribe. And as they're journeying on their trek, they're journeying across the ice, of course, but there's a, there's a, a volcano that explodes, and the heat from the lava starts melting all the ice bridges. They get across the ice bridge, but Diego gets cut off from them, and he jumps across the gap, and he just hangs on to the edge of the ice, and he's slipping, he's slipping, he can't, his claws can't grip it, and he's slipping down into, the, into, the, into his death when Manfred grabs him and hurls him to safety. And uh, Diego's very moved by this, and he turns to uh, Manfred, and he said, why did you do that? Why did you do that? You could have lost your life doing that. And Manfred said, that's what you do when you're part of a herd. You take care of each other. You look after each other. And Sid the Sloth comes up with a fantastic line. He says, I don't know about you guys, but we sure are one strange herd. 
Now I refrain from saying as I look around this room. <laughs> we are a very diverse family, aren't we? We are very diverse as Christians. The thing is, I wonder, I wonder if we as a group of individuals would actually choose to meet with each other if we weren't Christians. Hmm. It's true, isn't it? When, you, when, when you're in church, you probably are amongst a group of people who in normal circumstances, apart from our Christian faith, wouldn't have much in common, perhaps. And so we are, if you like, a strange family, as I prefer to put it. Uh, because, because we're so different. We are a group of people in fellowship. We're a community in fellowship, <coughs> seeking harmony through our diversity. Because it's like our bodies, isn't it? My body is very diverse. I've got arms and legs and eyes and bits you can see and bits you can't see. But it's a unity. It's a unity. When my back aches, the rest of me aches as well. So it's a, it's a unity because uh, when one part suffers, the whole part suffers. And uh, as we meet together this morning, we, we have a oneness of purpose to worship the Lord and to fellowship with each other. And, and we have mutual concern because we've prayed for people in Lebanon. We pray for people in Azerbaijan. We, we pray for those folk, and, and as we pray together, we learn together as well, because we, we, we're looking at the Bible together this morning. So, we are a community, and in the Living Bible it says, you belong in God's household with every other Christian. So, in a sense, mystically, if you like, in the right sense of that word, we, we are in harmony of fellowship with all the other believers across the world who are meeting today under whatever circumstances. It's the fellowship of the family. It's, it's a wonderful fellowship. When I go to church, I don't go to a building. I belong to a family. I belong to a family. And, it, and it, it's a loving community. It's a, it's a supportive, encouraging community. It's, a, it's challenging me constantly to keep moving forward. Don't, don't give up. Keep moving forward. And fellowship is not a formula. It's a result of a relationship together. We relate together and, and we fellowship together as a result. And now that's apparently one of the most expensive fragrances. So ladies, I don't think your husband will give you, be giving you that for Christmas or on your birthday. Apparently that's one, I don't know if it is, but I don't, and I don't know how many of you ladies use that fragrance here. Or even, <laughs> or even if some of the men do. <laughs> but, but when we meet together like this, there isn't some kind of mystical, spiritual fragrance that, that pervades the room, is there? It's the Spirit of God who comes amongst us. It's the Spirit of God who enables us. Uh, and he enables us to, enco to, to encourage each other and to strengthen each other. Do, do you, have you ever seen the nature... There's a nature um, series on television. There's lots of nature series. But there's one that shows the Battle of the Kruger. Have you seen that one, the Battle of the Kruger? Uh, you may do when I tell you. There's a, there's a, it shows, um, it's a strange, it, it's a unique uh, picture or little, little clip because it um, shows four lions attacking three buffaloes, three water buffaloes. And uh, they, they chase off the two adult buffaloes and they grab the little calf buffalo. And these four lions grab it and the little calf is fighting to stay alive because they're trying to bring it down. And they drag it, it's around the water hole, and they drag it in the battle, they get dragged, it all gets sort of dragged towards the edge. And as it gets dragged towards, two crocodiles get involved. So the poor little calf is being grabbed by crocodiles, you can see it in the water there, and, and the lions as well. And he's struggling, he's really struggling. And the, the herd has disappeared, the buffalo have disappeared. But then the herd reappears. And uh, two, three or four big bull buffaloes go for the lions. They're one at a time, they attack the lions. They gore one lion, they toss one lion in the air, and they chase off another lion. And then the, 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 the little calf is saved. What one buffalo couldn't do on its own, or what two couldn't do on their own, the herd working together was able to achieve. And sisters and brothers, 
as we work together, as we stand together, as we worship together, as we pray together, then we encourage each other and we look after each other. And uh, that's, that's what we should be doing, looking after each other. I know you do. I'm just reminding you of it. Because we need to be reminded. Of it. I'm sure there are those of us who over the past months have struggled with all sorts of issues and been grateful that we belong to a fellowship that cares. And people have phoned. People said, can I get shopping for you? That's what happened to me at the beginning because, I, because of my age, I had to self-isolate. And I had people phoning me up. People I didn't know, actually. Uh, people in my street, my neighbours, saying, can, can we get you shopping? We're going shopping. Can we get you any shopping? And, and, and that's happened in the churches as well, isn't it? And I'm sure it's happened here. Those of you that couldn't get out or are, are limited in some way are trying to help, have found help, and now you're trying to help others. Because that's the strength of the community of faith. <clears throat> so the writer says, don't stop meeting together. I'll finish with this. Oops, I'll, I'll finish with this. The last thing here is about don't forget to meet together because it helps us in our discipleship. Because we learn from the word and then we put the word into action um, in our ministry day by day, in our witness day by day. I, I confess this. I, I say to love, I love Robinson Crusoe's story as well. I like the original story of Robinson Crusoe. Uh, he, he was shipwrecked at the age of 27 or put, put, you know, thrown on, put on an island because of being a naughty boy. Um, marooned on an island at the age of 27. In the, that's, uh, in, the, in the book, he's, the ship is wrecked and he, he's marooned. And uh, he, he finds, when he's on the island, as you read the book, he finds that he's not on the island alone because of all the people he's ever met and impressed themselves upon his life go with him into the island. And so when he's cooking his food, he's thinking of his mum with a white apron and her rolled up sleeves in the kitchen in Hull. And, and he's, he's thinking of his dad and, and how he walked with his dad across the moors talking and how he's, he would sit by the fire talking with his dad. So all the people he's ever met in the book, their, their impressions and their impact on his, on his life are with him on the island. But one of the things that I find fascinating about this book in its original form, in its unedited form, is the impact of the Bible on him. And three times in the book, the Bible... Um, makes a big impact upon him. You see, he, he becomes ill and he remembers that um, the Brazilians used uh, chewing tobacco to uh, cure this particular illness. So he goes out to the shipwreck and he finds this chest with the tobacco in it, but it's also got a Bible in it. And he brings it back and he starts reading the Bible and Psalm 50 verse 15 is the one that speaks to him. Call unto me in the day of trouble and I will answer you. And so he starts reading the Bible. And in his sickness, he calls out for healing, and God heals him. Later on, he's conscious of his sin and all the things that he's done wrong in his life. And he goes back to Psalm 50, verse 15, and he cries out to God for salvation and finds salvation. And then later on, when the savages appear on the island and he's terrified, he goes back to that verse again, and he finds strength. And comfort. He doesn't read the word for entertainment. In the book, to be assured of the Father's care and the Father's love for him. And the word makes an impact upon his life. It's an amazing story, is Robinson Crusoe. If you've never read the original, it's a terrific story. And as we read the word this morning, as we look at the word this morning, then my prayer is that something in the word you can take away with you that will remind you of the Father's love, of the Father's care for you, of the Father's strength for you in every day of the days that lie ahead for each of us. And that we can encourage each other as we meet together this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you, Doug, so much. I trust we'll all meditate upon that, those thoughts during the coming week. I want us to end up.
with a song on the, on the screen, one that we all know very, very well, uh, Amazing Grace, but it's quite interesting. Uh, the person who wrote that lovely song, John Newton, was a slave trader, as you know. His ship got into great difficulties, and he prayed to God that he'd be saved, and if he was saved, he would give his life over to Jesus. And you'll see the ship, I think, it's a picture of a ship on the, as we, the song comes in, just, so that's why it's there. We just listen to this now before I close in prayer.
Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for being with us this morning. We pray that we may meditate all that we have heard this morning and remind us of what you have done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and this amazing grace that we have. So Father, just bless us now. Bless every home represented here. And we pray we may stay with you and keep close. Now until Jesus comes again. Amen. Amen. Amen.